I am not the loudest person in my family, which is, imp- when you'll, you'll see that's impressive later. Let me start with some prayer. <sighs> what a good day, Jesus. What a good day for us to have breath to breathe, to, um, to have people to gather and worship you with. And, and Father, as we gather here today, I pray two things. I pray that we would know how much you love us, 
and we would know that out of that love, we are called to love other people. Jesus, I pray that these words would, uh, they would be your words, Jesus. Would you, would, you help, would you help me to speak clearly, and would you help our hearts to be open, um, to hear what your scripture has to say to us today? Jesus, it's in your name we pray these things. Amen. Well, thanks for coming, guys. Uh, as Erica said, my name is Jake, and I get the joy of being on the staff team here. Um, and we are in the middle of a sermon series called Together. Together. So for the summer, we spent pretty much the whole summer looking at our vertical relationship with God, right? What does it look like to have a healthy relationship with God? Jesus gives a commandment. He says, this is number one priority, okay? If you're going to get anything from the Bible, get this. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and strength. Have a healthy relationship with God. And he says the second is exactly the same. Flip side of the coin. Love your neighbor as yourself. So as we've looked about healthy relationship with God, now we're like, well, okay, we should probably learn how to do the second half of that command. So we're learning what it looks like to live life together. Last week, Pastor Dave talked about friendship and the vital role that spiritual friendship plays in our lives. And this week, I'm excited to get to talk about community. And I'm excited because I love people. Um, I'm the kind of person who I would love to get coffee with every single person in this room. I want to hear your story. I want to know your name. And some of you introverts, your heart rate just spiked hearing that. And that sounds, you would probably rather die than do that, right? That's not me. I love people and I love community. In fact, I, I remember when I was a kid, I went fishing with my dad once. And this, this is the kind of thing every like six or seven year old boy loves to do. We have a photo of it. Um, you want to go fishing with your dad. It's cute. It's fun. Oh, yeah, totally. It's great. Um, I had a fantastic time. You know, I remember we woke up. They live north of Seattle. So we get up at 5 a.m. and it's fall. It's salmon season. And so we, we get up before the sun rises. I'm a sleepy six-year-old. We get some breakfast. You know, I remember the smell of his coffee as we drove our car out Highway 20 an hour and a half to a river. And it was fantastic. These are the, these are the moments, like if you're a dad, do this with your son because he'll remember it. Um, fantastic memory. But when we pulled up to the parking lot, it wasn't just my dad there. It was his camp buddies. And for me, that's exciting. And what you need to know about my dad's camp buddies, these are his good old days, friends. You look at photos of my parents' weddings, camp buddies. You talk to my mom about their wedding day, and I'll say, Mom, why didn't you get any food at your wedding? Camp buddies. <laughs> these are the people who my dad loves. Right? So he spent nine summers working at a scout camp out on Hood Canal. And if you multiply nine by eight, which is the number of weeks in a given camp, I'm not a numbers guy, I'm a people guy, but that comes out to 72 weeks. Over a year. Over a year of my dad's life, he spent with these people. He spent so much time with them. He learned to love these people, and they had a purpose. They weren't just there to hang out. They were there for a cause beyond themselves. And so he forged lifelong friendships. And so when I pulled out of the car, and I'm like, oh my gosh, my dad's camp buddies are here, I knew two things. The first thing I knew is that I was really embarrassed to be wearing this life vest because it was too small. <laughs> and the second thing I learned is I want friends like that. How do I get friends like that? I want good old days friendships. I wanted them. So I became a Christian in high school. I was 16. My buddy invited me to a youth group event, and from then on, I'm like, I'm in. I want to follow this Jesus guy, and I made some really good friends in high school. Some of them are still friends today, but when I got to college, I went to Western Washington University. It's not a Christian school, and I said, I want to do this. I want to follow Jesus in college. I want my college experience to be about following Jesus. So I got connected to a college ministry. I got plugged into my dorm's Bible study. I served on the worship team. I eventually led a Bible study. I got invested because I wanted to follow Jesus' commands to make disciples of all nations at college. But my junior year, my junior year, I moved into our college ministry house called the North Star. You can go to the next slide. These are my dudes. These are my silly, smelly dudes, right? These are the people whom I love. My good old days, if we're going to use that good old days language, right? I was probably in about half of these guys' weddings, and half of them were probably in about my weddings, right? But we wanted to follow Jesus together in college. 
So we spent a lot of time. I spent two years with these guys, right? And I lived with them. So you spend a lot of time with people you live with. We loved each other. We deeply loved one another. We practiced what Jesus commanded us to do. And we had a purpose. We were not content to just hang out in our house and play video games and do all that kind of stuff, although we did do that sometimes. What we were dedicated to was Jesus' call in our lives. We wanted to reach our campus for Jesus. So what do we do? Opening week, right? Opening week, you remember if you went to college, opening week, you're a freshman, and if you're a Christian, you're like, dude, how am I, I going to follow Jesus in college? Like, where are all the Christians? Let's, let's put her on a barbecue. So we put her on a barbecue with all of our friends, right? Out of our own very shallow college student's pocket, we put her on a barbecue so that people know, hey, if you want Christian community, come here. If you need a Christian dude in your life, come here. We want to be a presence in this community. Halloween. People make really bad decisions in college on Halloween. Well, how do, we, how do we help people celebrate Halloween in a good way? We have this four-story house. Let's turn the whole thing into a haunted house. So it was a lot of work, but it was an incredible memory. And we did that so that people could celebrate Halloween safely. We had worship nights. We had community dinner five nights a week. We did all kinds of things because we wanted our community, Western Washington University, to know the love of Jesus. In fact, if you go back to that picture one more time, I want to show you the top of this guy's head right here. This is Nate Marley. I love this guy so much that I'm driving out to Ellensburg next weekend to visit his new baby. And you really love someone if you drive to Ellensburg for them, right? My hope for you is you have these kind of relationships today. Not, not oh, 20 years ago on my high school football team, it was amazing, or, or not, you know, I served on my camp staff and it was great, or whatever. My hope is these are not distant memories for you. I hope, you know, this is 10 years ago for me. My hope is that you have these relationships today, maybe even in this room. But if the data holds true, that is not the case. Last week, Pastor Dave quoted a Pew study, said, hey, Americans, they are some of the loneliest people on planet Earth. <sighs> There's more data, right? Morning Consult commissioned Cigna, and they found a very similar study, right? They found that 58% of U.S. adults are lonely. 58%, and I guess the number's low. I guess it's more like 6 out of 10. And so what that means, you walk, you're like, we got to go grocery shopping at Costco after this, right? After you go grocery shopping at church, six out of ten people who you see in the grocery store are lonely. They are lonely, right? People are lonely. And millennials are not excluded from this. Like, I'm firmly in the millennial category, and there's, there's ground rules for being a millennial. And one of them is you have to have watched one of three shows all the way through. And you guys, millennials, are like, I know what that is, duh, I can answer it. I'll do it for you. It's the office, parks and recreation, and friends. We, amen? Amen, millennials? Okay, great. If you're not a millennial, if you're a Gen Z or a boomer or whatever, you fill in the blank. Where do you go to for entertainment? You know, is it your favorite podcast or your favorite social media influencer or your favorite talk show? We all kind of tend to do this. We all turn to these people for entertainment, Right? And I don't think there's an, anything inherently wrong with watching a TV show or listening to a podcast or anything. But I do want us to ask why. Why do we religiously watch these things? And I would propose to you that one of the bad reasons we do this is because we're lonely. Because we are lonely. And it is easier to watch other people on a screen living out their own good old days, fabricated good old days, than for us to go do that ourselves. We are lonely. But what if I told you this is not the way God created us? You see, if you are familiar with your Bible, you'll know that Genesis is the first book. If you open to page one, and by page one I mean like page four because of preface and notes and maps and everything, open to page one. And you'll read about God creating the heavens and the earth. You know, the, the earth was formless and void. The Spirit of God hovered over the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light and there was dark. And he separates them. And he calls the light day and, and the dark night. And he says, and it was good. And God creates thing after thing. The heavens and the earth and the, and the oceans and the skies and the plants and the trees and the animals. All the stuff. 
all the stuff. He creates it all. And at the end of all, he says, it's good. I have a problem with the word good because as a 21st century American, I hear good, and I'm like, that's like three-star Yelp review. Good. Right? Like if somebody came up to me after service and said, Jake, you have to go to this pizza place. It's good. Come on. I'm not going to waste my time with good pizza. Right? And so the biblical author, the word good is actually tov. Tov. It's a notoriously difficult word to translate because it means a lot of things. It means it's beautiful. It means it's complete. And it means it lacks nothing. So when God makes his stuff, he's not saying, yeah, three-star Yelp review, you know, probably wouldn't do it again, but whatever. He's saying it is beautiful. It is complete, and it does not lack anything. So then, what is the first problem we find in our Bibles? It is not Adam and Eve eating the forbidden fruit. It is not Satan tempting man. It is not Cain killing Abel. The first problem in our Bible happens before sin. What? Here it is in Genesis 2, 18. The Lord God said, it is not tov. It is not complete. It is not beautiful. It lacks something for the man to be alone. Time out. Time out, Jake. Okay, so let me get this straight. Adam is walking face to face with God. Like, I read my Bible and I pray every day so I can, like, get a glimpse of God. Here is Adam walking face to face with God. And you're saying that's not enough? Well, let me put it this way. God is all you need, and you will die if you don't drink water, right? God is all you need, and he created my body so that if I don't eat food regularly, I will wither away, and I will die. Yeah, God is all you need, and relationships are not a luxury. You are created for relationship. God created you for a desire for relationship that he himself could not satisfy, And that's not an accident. That is on purpose. That is the first problem we see in the scriptures, right? So this is why you can be so in love with Jesus. Man, you can go out of the worship services, and the only music that I listen to is worship songs. I listen to the Bible Project podcast every week, and this guy and that guy, and my prayer life's amazing, and I read the Bible, and I'm lonely. That's possible. That is a possible thing, and it's not because you don't have enough faith. It's because God says it is not tov. It is not good for you to be alone. So what that means for us today is that when you open up your Bibles and you're like, why should we do community, Jake? You don't really find anything. Because on page two, it says, hey, it's not good for you to be alone, so move on. The Bible does not say why I need to drink water. It is assumed, right? Instead, what we find are descriptions of how we are supposed to do community. There's a lot of them. There's like a lot, a lot of them. Like a majority of the New Testament is how do we do community well? But the most famous one is in your Bibles in Acts chapter 2. So if you open your Bibles up to Acts chapter 2, I'll give us a brief, brief context while you're turning there. Jesus has died. He's risen again. He's commissioned his disciples. Hey, your job is now to tell the world about me. People can have restored relationship with me, experience eternal life, all that good stuff, right? He gives the Holy Spirit to them, and he sends them out. And there's 120 people. That's it. First Christian church meeting, 120 people, less than this room. Peter stands up. Peter, early church leader, gives a sermon. 3,000 people come to Jesus. So all of a sudden, we have 3,120, give or take a few people. And of that community... This is the very first description of the Christian church in recorded human history. So it's probably important. You guys ready for this? Here's what it says. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, they, the church, and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs being performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything, everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. I love Acts. I love Acts because it's action, right? Like it's not a book. It's like, okay, here's what you need to do. It is an action-oriented book. 
And so when you read the things that are happening in Acts 2, you might be like, okay, that's really, that's a lot. That's really intimidating. I don't know if I can do this. I have good news for you, okay? This was written to and for and by first century Jews who were ethnic and religious minorities living under the boot of Roman foreign oppression, okay? You and I are 21st century Americans, right? So what that means is that they painted a picture with very specific colors. What I am more interested in is learning the color palettes. What are the color palettes that the early church painted with so that we can correctly apply those color palettes to our context? And I would propose to you that these three color palettes are time, love, and purpose. And we're going to spend the rest of our time unpacking how did the early church do time, love, and purpose. So let's, let's throw that scripture back up and let's highlight what deals with time, right? All the believers were together and had everything in common. They were together a lot. In fact, they were together so much, if you go to the next slide, it says, every day, Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts, right? So they met together a lot. Like 9 a.m. prayer meeting in this building every day. Who's going to be there? Anybody? Okay, cool. I'll be here. Great. Sounds good. Keith and I will be here and the rest of the staff. My point is they spent a lot of time together. And everything, I thought about highlighting everything because everything that they did involved them actually spending time together. So, but why did they spend so much time together? Why did they do that? Well, take a step back. Imagine you're one of the 12 disciples. You're like, okay, so we spent three years with Jesus, and we were wandering around. You know, we went to deserts, we went to, to the lake, and Jerusalem, and all this kind of stuff. So the early church didn't sit down in front of a whiteboard and open up their Google Doc, right, and say, okay, so do you guys think Rick Warren or Francis Chan's church planning strategy is going to be more efficient for the demographic of Jerusalem? No! What did they do? Well, what did Jesus do with us? We spent a lot of time with him. Yeah, that's great. Write that down. Write that down, right? Let's spend time together. And so that is actually what the early church did. You cannot build a meaningful relationship apart from meaningful time. You cannot build a meaningful relationship apart from meaningful time. You understand this. If your marriage, man, I want to have a better marriage, you actually have to spend time with your spouse. If you want to be a better dad or a more involved parent, you have to actually prioritize spending time with your kids, right? So we have to find time together. And what that looks like in our context is small groups and Tuesday nights. And that is a teaser trailer. We'll talk more about that later. But for now, understand that for the church to grow Acts 2 community, one of the most important ingredients, maybe the most important ingredient, was time together. The next color palette of the church was love. Love. They devoted themselves to fellowship and to the breaking of bread. And you can go to the next slide. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. This is the kind of community I really want to be a part of because the only thing that gets mentioned twice is food. Amen? Oh, so good. I love that the church actually shared meals together. That is a beautiful thing, right? They did not have a formula. They did not have a church planting strategy. Jesus could have given them a church planting strategy, right? They did not have that. What did they have? Take a step back again. Okay, so Jesus spent a lot of time with us, and oh, there's something he talked about a lot. What was, what was that thing he talked about all the time? Right, John 13, 35, he says this. By this... Everyone will know you're my disciples if you love one another. If you love one another. So what does the early church do? Hey, man, you're hungry. Why don't, why don't I sell this and then buy you some food? Hey, you need a place to crash? Come over to my place. Let's figure this out, right? They did not just love in feeling. They loved in action. They did not just love in feeling. They loved in action. And the cool thing is that the more they acted in love, the more they actually grew in love for one another, right? And this kind of love is actually life-changing. This kind of love, when you experience it, it changes your life. In fact, I have experienced this kind of love in my own life, and it has transformed me. You guys, you guys remember 2020? Anybody? Yep, cool, great. Nope, you blocked it out of your memory. Amen. 
So in case you didn't know this, in case you forgot, in 2020, March of 2020, there was a thing called COVID, right? And it was tough. It was a tough time. We, we got quarantined. We lost loved ones. It was a tough time. And in April of 2020, my beautiful baby daughter, Emily, was born. What a gift. And you know, honestly, quarantine, bummer, but extra paternity leave? I mean, that's, that's all right with me. In May of 2020, our path for 2020 and the rest of the world's diverged because out of nowhere, my wife was diagnosed with Hodgkin's lymphoma, which is a type of cancer. And it was brutal. I, I put in my notes to say she beat cancer because I tell the story and forget it, so she beat cancer. So. so when I forget to say that at the end, you're not like, does she still have cancer? She beat cancer. This was hard. And if you or a loved one you know has gone through a cancer journey, I'm sorry, and it takes a lot. Cancer takes a lot from you, right? Chemotherapy, it's all she had to go through, but there's radiation, there's immunotherapy. It is brutal. And to go through that in the middle of a pandemic was, was pretty terrifying, right? One of the things that we were robbed of that you don't think about in this story is that we had a six-week-old baby girl at this moment. My wife's body is being pumped full of poison and chemotherapy, so she could not breastfeed our daughter. That was a, that's a very important thing. That's time you don't get back. I can't look at her. I'm going to cry. Um, that's time you don't get back. And your daughter is so dependent on that milk to survive. It is the only thing they need to survive, and we couldn't provide that for her. And that's painful. On top of everything else, that's just kind of the cherry on top. And this is where we enter into the story of the Marleys. You guys remember that guy's head I told you about? You could throw up this slide. This is a picture of uh, Nate, his wife, and I, and Rachel with our new son, Caleb, at another North Star guy's wedding. And I love these guys. Man, we, we were tight in college. They loved us. I mean, they're fantastic. But it's 2020. We haven't lived in the same city as them since 2016. So it's been four years since we lived in the same town as these guys. Now, we love them. Like, if they moved to Vancouver, I would buy a duplex with them, right? I, they're those kind of friends. But we haven't lived together for years. Maggie had recently had her own baby in 2020. And she's like, well... I can, I can pump some milk and get it to you guys. And without our knowledge, she reached out to our old community up in Bellingham, Washington. So Ellensburg, Bellingham, we're in Eugene at the time. And they got together, our friends, and our friends of friends, and the friends of the friends of the friends. And they gathered as much breast milk as they could to provide for our daughter. And they drove down, they could barely fit the coolers in the car, right? Four months worth of breast milk for our daughter. Four months. This kind of love is life-changing. It's life-changing. This is Acts 2 love, but Acts 2 love doesn't always look that incredible. It's not always, you know, saving the daughter of a chemo patient. Sometimes it's just meeting a new family at church. Oh, you're new here. Come over to my house for dinner. I know, I know what it's like to be new here. Sometimes it's you're sitting in small group and you know, you know this guy's got something to say, but he's a hard time being vulnerable. So you go first. And you're vulnerable first. So then, then he feels comfortable being vulnerable. It looks like signing up. When there's missions opportunities, serve our city. Or um, uh, what's the, oh my gosh, I forgot the name of it. Family promise, right. Yeah, family promise. It looks like serving. And it looks like the little things. Mother Teresa says, do little things with great love. There's no small things. It's just little things with great love. Right? This kind of relationship doesn't happen overnight. And at the same time, I haven't been in a Bible study with these guys for the better part of a decade, right? So these kind of relationships, when you build them the right way, will last a lifetime. Love always grows best when there is a greater purpose at hand. Love always grows best when there's a greater purpose at hand, which brings us to the last of the color palettes the church used, which is purpose. You can go to the next slide. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to prayer, everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs being performed by the apostles. And enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. The Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. 
See, the early church, they loved people. But they didn't just have people over for dinner for the sake of having people over for dinner. They wanted to love people. They had experienced the magnificent love of the Father that is in Jesus. And they said, I could share that. I could share that. Man, it's up to them to respond. But man, I'm, I just want you to know how Jesus has loved me. Can I love you like that? Right? And so the community that they built was not a means to an end. The community they built was meant to be shared. The community they built was not a means to an end. The community they built was meant to be shared. I just, I just want you guys to, to visualize with me a minute. Let's, let's say, you know, those 3,000 people come to faith in Jesus, and one of them's name's Cornelius. And Cornelius is like, Peter, oh my gosh, that sermon was amazing. I've never heard anything like this before. I would love to follow Jesus. I would love to learn what that means, but, you know, the problem is the Bible in this form does not exist. How it exists is in a bunch of scrolls, and unless you're rich or live in a synagogue, you don't have access to it. And I also probably don't read, and I can't go listen to podcasts or sermons or whatever. I can't do this on my own. The access that this new Christian would have had to Jesus was Peter. Just picture this. Peter, Peter looks at Cornelius, and he says, Cornelius, love your heart. So excited for you. Here's the thing. The 12 and I, we, we got a good thing going, man. Our small group's full. Like, I'm so excited that you want to follow Jesus, but eh. like Matthew didn't like Matthew at first, but I really learned to love Matthew. Now he's like a brother to me. So if someone moves or whatever, that's great. But for now, like just, just go figure it out. No one in this room is a Christian. No one. Actually, no one outside of the 12 is a Christian. If that is the attitude of the early church, they were on mission because they had a purpose, Right? This is what Paul talks about in 1 Thessalonians when he writes this. He says, just as a nursing mother cares for her children, so we cared for you. You know, I had the second half of this verse memorized. I didn't have the first half memorized before this sermon. That's got a lot more meaning to me now. Because we loved you so much, we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel, not only the information, not only, hey, repent and believe in Jesus or the baptism, whatever, but, um, of God, but our lives as well. They were not content to share information with the people. They shared their lives as well. That's different. That's different than me just handing you a Bible and saying, hey, go read this thing, and you know, God loves you and all that kind of stuff. There's a difference between that and me inviting you into my home and saying, let's, let's talk about Jesus together. Because it's not tov for man to be alone. Because I can give this to you, and you can still be lonely. According to the scriptures themselves, because God created us for community. So you read this Acts 2 chapter. Oh my gosh, this is really intimidating. There's like a lot happening here. Um, wow, it's a really intimidating chapter, right? We're focusing on the color palettes on purpose. Because, right, the, the color palettes are the same, but again... First century Jews, 21st century Americans. So, so one, thing I, one thing you can walk away with is saying devoted. I need to be devoted to fellowship. I need to do that. That has to happen. And I love this. I love Sundays. I love worship, and I love teaching, and I love all that stuff. And at the same time, if I were to sit down and have a conversation with every single one of you after the service, it would take me multiple days, right? So I cannot... No one can love each other in the way that Jesus commands us in the full capacity on Sundays. So what do we do? Last time, take a step back. Jesus, okay, what did Jesus do? Well, I remember there's these 12 guys, and they hung out with Jesus, and he called them to himself. He spent three years hanging out with him. That's kind of like, you know, this is a pretty big group. What if we just called it like a smaller group? Maybe a small group. Maybe that'll catch on, right? What if we called it small group? And what if we devoted ourselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and the breaking of bread and to prayer? What if we lived these things out in community, right? This fall, we're breaking ground. We are breaking ground on building small groups. These are the kind of places where you build those relationships. Not that you want, but that you need, right? And small groups, they're not this magic thing. There's not a magic formula, right? And it takes time and you might not become best friends with everyone in your small group, and that's okay, right? 
you will not build lifelong friendships overnight, but you build them a lot faster than you would if you sat at home all day, right? It takes effort and time and love and purpose to build these kind of relationships. My guess, my guess is when I talk about loneliness, there's two kinds of people in this room. The first ones, I say six out of ten people are lonely. That's me. That's me. I just, I don't know what it is. I used to have friends or I have nominal friends, but I feel lonely. When I get to the end of the day, I feel lonely. I am not experiencing the kind of relationships that I'm supposed to, right? My challenge to you is one of two things, okay? Ready? If you're going to get anything from this sermon, like flush all the rest of it out, just hear this one part. Join a small group or come to Tuesday nights. That's it. That's the antidote. The antidote is to spend time and love and purpose with one another. So as we're building small groups, right, if you're like, oh man, there's not enough small group leaders, great, we do Tuesday nights on purpose. They are intentional, and I have a secret plan. You guys don't know my secret plan? My secret plan is to build small groups out of Tuesday nights. <gasps> what? We can do that. That's amazing. Prioritize Tuesday nights, right? Coming out of COVID, a lot of us are wounded and broken. We've lost a lot. Some of us have even lost loved ones. But something I would guess that every person in this room has lost is relationships. Friendships with people who you thought, man, they are my closest friends, and all of a sudden, I don't even recognize you. I don't know what's happening. Why, why do we have enmity with each other? Or quarantine, the isolation that comes from that. Man, I was working with college students in the throes of COVID. Six out of 10 was generous. I think it would have been nine and a half out of 10 were lonely in that time, right? We have all lost relationships. And the pain and the thought of, I'm not gonna go make new relationships. I know what happened last time. I'm, fool me once, shame on you, but fool me twice. I don't really wanna do that. And you're content to just sit on the sidelines and be alone. I'll tell you what, the pain of community is real. It is real. You will get hurt. But in the long run, the pain of isolation is always greater than the pain of community. In the long run, in the long run, the pain of isolation is always greater than the pain of community. That's not you. I'm good. Man, I got friends. I feel like I got my good old days, buddies, you know, look at that picture. I'm like, yeah, I'm thinking of this person in this room. Would you pray? Would you open-handedly pray about building that kind of community for other people? Would you open-handedly pray about leading a small group so that other people can experience the life-transforming relationships that you have experienced? Because this is the gospel. This is the gospel that Jesus was in the perfect small group with the Father and the Spirit perfect relationship, right? There was no pain or baggage or none of that. He was perfect. It was amazing. And yet he saw his children and he saw the pain of loneliness and the pain of sin and brokenness and isolation. And he said, I will enter into that so that we can have restored relationships so that you can come be a part of my fellowship. That is the gospel. So much of the time we talk about, man, you need to have a restored relationship with God. And you do, 100%. But something we neglect to talk about is that restored relationship with God should lead to restored relationship with other people, right? The great commandment, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and strength, check. But also love your neighbor as yourself. We want to do what Jesus did. We want to walk in this kind of Acts 2 community, but it takes us being devoted to one another. Even when we stomp on each other's toes and we say things that are kind of mean or unintentional or whatever. But it will take dedication and devotion. Will you pray with me? Jesus, I'm very thankful that you are not content to sit in heaven and to say, well, I'll figure it out. You guys can do this. You put on you put on skin and bone, you put flesh in the game and you moved into the neighborhood. You lived among your people and you actually showed us, Jesus, what it looks like to live in community. 
Father, I pray that this church, would this church break that statistic? Six out of 10, man, I pray it would be zero out of 10 in the name of Jesus. And Lord, that doesn't happen magically. That happens by devotion. Lord, help us to be devoted to one another in the way that you are devoted to us. We love you, Jesus. It's in your name we pray all these things. Amen.